Luke chapter 11, and you're going to need your seatbelts tonight. And I'm probably going to make some of you frustrated and upset, which is okay. Not me. It's We're going to look at the scripture. Some of you guys at home <laughs> may not tune in. Well, don't tune in next week anyway, because I'll be at camp. I won't be here. But some of you at home are going to go, hmm, this guy's a little crazy. But the nice thing is it's going to be recorded. You can go back and re-listen re, re, re to it and get your Bible out and check me out, which is what you're supposed to do anyway. Okay. Um, so tonight, I'm not bringing this topic up. It's coming up in the course of everything. So anyway, so Luke chapter 11. What was that? Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> for 41 years we've had four years. Yeah, it's going to be a long ride home. I wonder if I'll fit in the trunk. <laughs> no, because then I'll have to, she'll have to drive. She's like, no. All right. All right. I really got to do this. All right. Let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, we come before you tonight and we bless you. We do honor you. We thank you for your word, all of it, even though some of it is is hard sometimes. We humble ourselves tonight. We ask that you help us to see your truth and not let it be clouded by what we believe is the truth. We, we bless you and honor you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 11 and verse 14. Luke chapter 11 and verse 14, and he was casting out a demon. Talking about Jesus, and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And others to test him were demanding of him uh, a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, you know, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a house divided against itself fails. So if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For I say to you, for you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him and takes away from takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributed his plunder. He, excuse me, on which he has relied and distributed his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of him, we'll stop there. So what is this idea of blasphemy? Because if we read this, and we're going to go read it in Mark chapter 3 in a minute, Matthew 12 is the other place this shows up. You can write those down so you can go check them. The only unforgivable sin in Scripture, according to most people, is what? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. So if you had to define blasphemy, could you? <laughs> Isn't that shocking that if it is an unforgivable sin, the church has never taught you what it is, so how do you know if you did it? Is that, is that when we deny the Holy Spirit? Oh, see? That's what the church says it is. Is when a lost person, when God knocks on the door of a lost person's heart, and that person pushes the Holy Spirit away, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's what the church teaches you. But let's look at Scripture tonight, find out what it is. Well, let me, let's start off by defining blasphemy, Okay. So if you're looking for another passage, we are going to go to Mark chapter 3 in a little bit. So this is the dictionary definition of blasphemy. Do not write this down, because this is not the scriptural definition. According to the dictionary, blasphemy is the act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or sacred things or profane talk. What does this definition say? You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit with your mouth. Well, if that's the case, I'm gone because I've said some pretty, pretty nasty things in my life. But what is the Bible? How does the Bible define blasphemy? So write down Numbers 15, 
30. We're going to start in verse 27, but Numbers 15, 27 through 31. Please go and check this out for yourself. Numbers 15, 27 through 31. Also, if one person sins unintentionally, okay, and then he shall offer uh, a one-year-old female goat for a sin offering. Excuse me. The priest shall make atonement before the Lord and for the person who goes astray when he sins unintentionally, making atonement for him, uh, that he may be forgiven. And you shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is native among all the sons of Israel and for the alien who sojourns among them. So there's a, a group of laws for people who sin unintentionally. You got that? But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or alien, that one blasphemes the Lord. Hmm. And that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. And that person shall be completely cut off and his guilt will remain on him. The definition of blasphemy. <laughs> is the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord. Those are not my words. That's right there in your Bible, Numbers 15.30. That's the definition of blasphemy. Now, what does it mean to sin defiantly? Everybody look at me. I'm going to guess we've all done it. Any of you have a rebellious streak besides my wife? (laughs) Now I'm really... I'm going to walk home tonight. That's it. Okay. I, I was born rebellious. I, I, I literally remember going to Stone, Stone Mountain, Georgia um, on, a, on a high school trip, and we rented bicycles. My buddies and I rented a bicycle, and there was a card on the front of the bicycles, 10 things not to do with what, while you're riding the bicycle. We, made a, a pur- we purposed ourselves to break all 10 of those rules, in, in, that's, you know. It's part of who I am. I, I, my old nature wants to sin defiantly. Now, here's the question. What does that mean, mean to sin defiantly? Well, we're going to talk about that for just a minute. So defiant sin is when a person knows better and defiantly engages in an activity over time. If anyone denies me before men, I will deny him before my father and his, who is in heaven. Right? You've heard that scripture, right? But what did Peter do the night that Jesus was, was, was taken to trial? So was that blasphemy? How come Peter got to go to heaven? How come Jesus didn't deny him before the Father? Because we're not talking about an event. We're talking about a lifestyle. Do you understand the difference? There's a difference between a sin and a lifestyle. We have all tripped and fallen in the mud, all of us. But when we ask for forgiveness for that, what does God do according to 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sin, what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what if we decide we're not going, we're going to just continue to live this way? What does the Bible say? And that's the issue that we're dealing with here in talking about blasphemy. Remember, this is all about blasphemy. We need to be able to define it in order to be able to identify it. So, is there anywhere else in Scripture that talks about this? Yes. First place we need to go is Hebrews 10. Yes. You want to stay out of the book of Hebrews. It's a dangerous book. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 26. Now, everybody who's listening to me tonight is going to ask this question. Pat, do you believe you can lose your salvation? And the answer to that is no. And the answer, people, at, people at, what, what sounds like it, could you earn, can you earn your salvation? If you can't earn it, how could you lose it? Who's in charge of it? God is. Now, Here's the question that nobody asks. Do y'all believe God is sovereign? What does that mean? What does that mean? Not just in charge. What does sovereign mean? What? He is all powerful. But he gets to do whatever he wants. 
Now, here's the question. Listen to me carefully. If God is sovereign, all-powerful, in charge of everything, can he, I'm not saying will he, can he, does he have the capacity and the ability to revoke your grace gift? I'm not saying he will. I'm asking if he can. And if the possibility exists that he can, then I need to read these scripture passages passages in light of the warning that they are. We need to be careful. We need to be very, very careful. So Hebrews 10, starting in verse 26, and we're going to go through 31 because that's all one thought. All right. You see verse 26? For if we go on sinning willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he he deserves who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Now, if I was a normal preacher, which you all know is not true, (laughs) but if I was a normal preacher, what I would say, you see verse 26 there? For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving a knowledge of the truth. See that phrase, knowledge of the truth? Well, it was just in my head. It wasn't in my heart. I wasn't transformed. I wasn't changed. It was just something I ran into. And I thought about it, and then, you know, I went on sinning willfully. Well, I've heard that preached a lot of times. The problem with that is, what do preachers always tell you about context? Read it in context, read it in context, read it in context. Well, verse 26 says that if we go on sending willfully after we receive a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. But what does verse 29 say? How much severe punishment do you think he de- he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? You see that phrase, by which he was sanctified? That means he was made holy by the blood of the covenant, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Is there anywhere in Scripture that we can point to that a person who was lost remained lost, even though they were made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ? No. No. Doesn't exist. So who is the writer of Hebrews talking to here? People who have been sanctified by the blood of the covenant. I can't go beyond what's written. I'm warning you that this is a warning from the writer of Hebrews. What he says is if you go on sinning, how? What does it say? Willfully or deliberately, depending on your passage. There are two things here. Go on sinning a lifestyle, not an immediate, not an it, not an a, a point in time, or even for a short season. And 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 I explain it this way. Look, the Bible says in First Corinthians six nine that adulterers have no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. So what if a person who is a Christian falls into temptation and commits adultery? Maybe it's a one night stand. Maybe it goes on for a couple of months and they realize that it's wrong. They confess, they change their behavior, they repent, they go away from it. They restore their relationship with their spouse or they have to deal with the consequences because sin kills things. But they repented and they moved on and never did it again. Is that what we're talking about? No, we're talking about serial adulterers. We're talking about people who live a lifestyle of adultery their whole lives, okay? The Bible says they have no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. So we need to be very clear about this. What happens is when people talk about these warnings, we think, well, I did that. I sinned deliberately. After I received knowledge of the truth, there's probably no sacrifice for me left. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you were, um, if you were sanctified by the blood of the covenant, And you receive the Holy Spirit, you walk by the Holy Spirit, and you look at him and you say, do not bother me. I want to be me. What is that called? If anyone sins defiantly, whether native-born or alien, that person blasphemes the Lord. Oh, Brother Pat, I don't want to talk about this tonight. I just wanted to have a nice namby-pamby candy cane Bible study tonight. The Bible is full of warnings. 
Now, I'm going to tell you that I will get pushback on this, and I'm okay with that. I, I've been teaching this for years now. These warnings, and that's what I believe they are, is warnings. People say, well, who would ever do that? Who would walk hand in hand with God, receive the Holy Spirit, and then look at God and say, no, I want to be me, leave me alone. Well, let's put it real simply. Did not Lucifer stand in the very presence of God, yes. created by God, and saw the holiness of God, and reflected the holiness of God in his beauty, and he said, you're not good enough. You are not good enough to be God. I will ascend my throne above yours. If it's possible for a being to stand in the very holy presence of God and have that much pride within themselves in sin, what makes me think that I'm any better than that? Oh, Brother Pat, you're talking about something. I'm talking about something that's a warning. That's a possibility because God is sovereign. And we need to be careful because sometimes we treat our grace gift carelessly. Well, I can go do whatever I want. I got my first John 1 9 card. I'll just confess it and God has to forgive me. God doesn't have to do anything. He does not serve me. He is not my genie. I am his slave and I need to act accordingly. So we be careful here. So we go back to this idea of, of um, this unforgivable sin. I want to take you to Mark chapter 3 so we understand what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is. Mark chapter 3, it's the same context, it's the same thing that's going on. You know, they were saying that Jesus had a demon and he was driving out demons by the, by the power of Satan. Verse 20 of Mark chapter 3. Again, I say verse 20 of Mark chapter 3. You need to read this for yourself. Again, I will be, I will challenge strongly anybody who stands up and says that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit approaches the lost person and the lost person pushes him away, which is what I grew up believing. It's what I grew up being taught. You will not see that anywhere in this passage. This is where this comes from here in Matthew 12. Okay, Matthew, Mark chapter 3 and verse 20, talking about Jesus. And he came home and a crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And he called them to himself, and he began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Sound familiar? What we just read in Luke. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is he is finished. And no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property, un, property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sin shall be forgiven the son of men and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. What they were saying was that every time Jesus did a miracle, every time Jesus cast out a demon, he wasn't doing it by the power of God or the Holy Spirit. He was doing it by the power of Satan. They were giving Satan credit for the work of God. And these were the church people. And they knew better. How do I know they knew better? John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to at night and he says, he says, Master, we know you're from God because no one can do the things you were doing unless... He was from God. They knew better. If we deliberately go on sinning after we receive the sacrifice of truth, anyone who sins defiantly, whether native born or alien, blasphemes the Lord. These guys knew better. They were trying to sway the crowd into saying, he isn't the son of God. He is not doing this by the power of God. He is doing this because he himself is demon possessed and more so than these other demons. And that's how we can cast him out. Don't listen to him. That is what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. They knew better, and they did it anyway. 
We would never do anything like that. We know better. Hmm. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Let me give you a couple examples of what this looks like. Matthew chapter 6. Lord's Prayer. We just studied pray, prayer, didn't we? Different, different version of the same prayer. But in Matthew, right at the end of the Lord's Prayer, he says this, Matthew 6, starting in verse 14. For you, if you forgive others their transgression, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. You see that? Look at that. But if you do not your Father See that? Look, look, look right here. Will not. It's an act of God's will. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Unfortunately, I don't have to interpret it because we're going to look at a parable that Jesus tells about this. But I want you to understand this. In all my years of ministry, do you know how many times I've heard somebody say, well, as long as so-and-so is in that church, I will never go there. I don't go to the church because those people hurt me. I'm going to be angry and carry a grudge. If you do not forgive your brother when he sins against you, your heavenly father will not forgive you. What is this here? If you do not. That's an intentional sin. Because we're commanded twice in the New Testament, in the New Testament, that we are forgiven. Just we, are forget, we are to forgive just as we have been forgiven. How did God forgive you? When you deserved it? After you confessed? Or did he forgive you before the offense when Jesus died on the cross and took away the penalty of our sin? Oh, I've gone to meddling, haven't I? Gone to meddling. Forgiveness is hard. But look at what it says. If you sin deliberately, God will not forgive your sin. Now go back and look at the Lord's Prayer right above it there. Look at verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. What if I haven't forgiven my debtors? What did I just pray? I want you to forgive me in the way that I didn't forgive them. I just exactly prayed what, Je what, what Jesus said. And you notice those words are in red. They're not... They're not some commentator. Jesus said, here is an example of willful sin. Here is an example of blasphemy. Brother Pat, you don't understand how badly I was hurt. Anybody nail you to a cross while you were innocent? Yeah, but, but, but that wasn't anything to compare to what I suffered with. Cross, what he, yeah, he, had to do. he was heartbroken. Yeah, and so I'm, 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 I'm just telling you guys. I know what the Bible says, and I know about the philosophical arguments about eternal life. You know, if God gives you eternal life, eternal means eternal, and it doesn't go back. I understand that. You know, Hebrews chapter eleven says that 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 that, that God said, "I will never leave you or forsake you." I understand that, and I'm not telling you anything more than blaspheming God is intentional, willful sin when you know better. And I'm only showing you what Scripture says, and I'm telling you over and over and over again that I believe that these are warnings to the church. Now, we all know church people who walk in these sins. We know them. But it doesn't mean they're Christians. You understand that? I'm talking to the church. There are warnings in Scripture. Now, how do I know that Jesus is actually saying means what he says here, that if you do not forgive, God will not forgive your sins. We'll go to Matthew 18. I don't have to interpret this because God did it already. Now, very simple passage. Doesn't really need much explanation, and I won't put much commentary on it. I'm just going to explain a few terms to you. Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. Uh, 
All ready? And then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. We all know those verses, right? Yes. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, talent is about 15 years wages back then. 10,000 of those, 10,000 times 15 years wages. I think when I figured this out was or, or the early 2000s, it, 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 it comes out to about $3 billion in today's money. Okay? Took the average household income in America, multiplied it times 50, 15 and multiplied that by 10,000. Came up to about $3 billion. So when Jesus uses the term 10,000, he knows it's an unrepayable debt. That's why he used that money, that, that, that much. It wasn't 10,000 coins. It was an unrepayable debt. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children, all he had and re- so that repayment, uh, repayment to be made. And the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave the debt. What happened to the $3 billion debt? It was wiped off the books. Okay. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, somewhere around $5,000. Most of us in here couldn't do without $5,000. Okay. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground. Oh, and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and he went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what he was owed. This is where it gets hard. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and they came and reported it to their Lord, all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the tortures until he should repay all that was owed him. Now, If you go and read Dr. MacArthur's, John MacArthur's commentary on this, he will say this is not a re-encumbrance of the previous debt. It's an encumbrance of a new debt. Okay. I disagree with that. I don't think the text supports that. Dr. MacArthur's theology requires this to be a new debt, not re-encumbered with the old debt, the unpayable debt, because God doesn't do that. But what does the king get to do? Whatever he wants. He's the king. When I read this, just being dumb me, he should he told him to, pay, to repay everything he owed. What did the king do with the original debt? He put it back on the books. I didn't write this. Jesus spoke this. This is not the important verse. Thirty first, thirty five is the important verse. He's getting excited. He's getting filled with the puppy spirit. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you. If each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart, my heavenly father will also do the same to you. What, do what? Put back the original debt. Now, there are people out there who are going to say, that's not what this means. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. In my foolish mind, when I read this, all I see is the guy had the debt. The king canceled the debt. The guy went out and did not show the same mercy to someone else. And the king re-encumbered him with an unpayable debt. I don't care if it's the original or another one, but if it's $3 billion and he makes 68 cents a day in jail, how long is he going to be in jail? You go figure it out. I'm telling you, Jesus told this parable to warn us about the power of unforgiveness because it is a willful sin on our part. Now, be careful here because you will hear people say this when you talk about unforgiveness. I don't feel like forgiving them. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's an act of your will. It's a choice. You forgive. And that's a whole nother sermon, not for tonight. 
But when Jesus was beaten to a bloody pulp, hanging on a cross, eyes swollen shut, beard ripped out, skin, uh, bo- uh, I mean, organs and bones showing on his back from being beaten with the cat of nine tails. Do you think he felt like saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? No, it was an act of his will to plead for us and those of them who put him on the cross. To intercede in the middle of his suffering, that was an act of his will. And we need to be careful. There's another example. Go to John 15. And and I'm not going to spend all night doing this. This is the last one I'm going to do. But I could show you more examples than this. John 15. I want you to look at it in your Bible. I've got it up here on the screen. But Jesus says, I am the true vine, right? And my father is the vine dresser. And every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the true vine, and you are the branches. And he who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now you see that? See that phrase right there? Notice what that said. If you're abiding in God, you don't have to work at this. It's a natural outflow. He who abides in me, he will bear much fruit. Okay? And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay? Um, For apart from me, you can do nothing. For if one does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they are gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Well, again, those people trying to defend a certain, certain type of theology say, well, these branches weren't really connected. Well, then why does Jesus keep using the phrase in me? And if you go back into John 14, the number of times he says, um, I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and you're in me. This phrase in me means connection. Well, let me show you what this means. So this is the vine, right? Pretty simple, straightforward. This is the vine and this is the branch. So this is Jesus and this is you. Pretty simple, right? And what is this? Where did it come from? Did it come from the branch or the vine? came from the vine because the life of the branch is connected directly to the vine. If the vine is dead, the branch is dead. We know that Jesus is not dead. So whatever is produced here came from the source here. It was not produced in here. So what does that make this? Nothing more than a straw. A conduit. Because he who abides in me, he bears much fruit. You know, see what the Bible said? It's a natural outgrowth of abiding in Jesus. And well, we'll talk about fruit another time. That's not the point. So if the essence of Jesus is flowing up here and it flows through the vine and produces this, how does this stop growing? Because any branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts off. How does this stop growing if this is no more than a conduit? Because the conduit becomes actively resists the vine. It creates a clogged artery, if you will. Somebody says, I'm not going to act like that. If we decide that this here is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control, and I don't want to live like that. I want to be selfish. I want to have a me-centered world. Everything is going to be about me, and even what God does is about me. You begin to choke off the flow of the Spirit. You begin to choke off the flow of God into the natural outgrowth of the fruit. Because I'm the most important thing in the world. And we need to be careful because we hear that in our theology all of the time. I've said this to you a few weeks ago. Your salvation is a byproduct of Jesus' obedience to God. Because Jesus came to appease the wrath of God by being a perfect sacrifice that hung on a cross, destroyed the power of Satan, died, and was resurrected. But that battle had to do with God's authority over Satan, retaking that authority that he had given him. And that battle, my salvation was a byproduct of that. But doesn't Jesus, doesn't the Bible say Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost? 
Yeah, he did. But if you read it in context, he's talking about Israel. Not me. And we need to be careful. We need to be careful. This is a conscious act of rebellion to cut off that flow of fruit. If we deliberately go on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins left, but only a fearful expectation of the fire the, the, of the judgment of God in the fiery furnace. Something I got my brain just sorted out. Um, you know, Numbers sixteen thirty: that anyone who sins defiantly, whether native born or alien, blasphemes the Lord. This is not a singular teaching in one side of the Bible or the other. It's all in there, but we don't talk about it. We have to explain it away because our theology doesn't support the fact that a sovereign God could look at you and say, I've had enough. I'm done. Hmm. What about Romans chapter 1? Romans chapter 1. And again, I'm just giving you examples. This is all through Scripture. This is not a singular teaching from a one crazy preacher. Romans chapter, cha chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Who are these people? Lost people, right? Right? Well, let's keep reading. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal powers, divine nature have clearly been seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, it doesn't say they knew about God. They knew him. See that? For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they, came, they became futile in the speculation of their foolish hearts. And professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God and an, an image for the form of the corruptible, corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over. And you can go on and read what he did to them when he gave them over. He gave them over to their sin. They wanted it, and he said, fine, have it. But he gave them over. They knew God. They didn't know about God. They knew him. And I think Paul was very specific in the way he worded that. Brother Pat, that's just not the God I worship. He loves me so much he would never. Oh, don't ever say God would never. Because I will be honest with you, I've been studying about God for 40 years almost. And I still don't know him very well. I know his heart and I can hear his voice in my spirit. And I know when he nudges me and he says, hey, <laughs> don't do that. Stop being an idiot. And that's when I get on my face and I say, I'm sorry. And sometimes it's not right away. Sometimes I just want to sit in my puddle and fart. I can't say that in church. <laughs> I'm sorry for you at home. But don't you ever just feel that way? You just want to get in your mud puddle and sit down and just... And I just want to stay here because I'm mad at the world and I'm tired and, and God hates me and I just want to feel sorry for myself. And then I come to my senses and I crawl out of my mud puddle and I'm muddy and I go back to God and I say, how can you put up with me? And he goes, because I love you. And I repent and I go away from that mud puddle. I'm not telling you there won't be another mud puddle along the way somewhere but I don't go back to that one. So what we're talking about here is people who know God. These guys knew God. Hebrews 10, 26, they had been um, sanctified by the blood of the, the blood of the covenant. Um, in Israel, they were connected 
to the nation if anyone sins defiantly, whether native born or alien, he was connected to the nation. These are not people on the outskirts. These are people on the inside. The Bible is very clear about that. The guys in, in Mark chapter 3, they were the scribes from Jerusalem who were saying, he has the devil. And they knew better. We know that because of what Nicodemus said in John chapter 3. So I'm telling you and I'm warning you, be careful. I love, I love how C.S. Lewis sums up the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Lucy is standing up at, at, in, the, in the castle of Ker Paravel, and, and, and Aslan has finished his work, and they're having a big coronation celebration, and everybody's paying attention. And Lucy and Mr. Tumnus happen to walk out on the deck, and they see Aslan walking away down the beach. And, and Lucy's getting ready to run after him, and Mr. Tumnus stops him, and he said, Remember, Aslan is not a tame lion. And I think we in our modern day religion have tamed God and made him fit into our image of what God is. But he is not a tame lion. He is the lion of Judah. Yes, he is the lamb of God, but he is the lion of Judah. He is an all consuming fire, according to scripture. He is wrathful and vengeful. And he will not let the wicked go unpunished. I don't like these teachings. I like the unicorn and fuzzy bunny teachings. They're my favorite. But if I'm going to be a true minister of the gospel, I have to show you that there are warnings all throughout scripture. Do not take your grace gift for granted and do not treat God like he's not God. Because he is. And we will all answer to him one day. Be careful. Well, let's go and finish this section in Luke chapter 11. Because he gives some war- a couple of other, well, one other warning. In verse 24, starting in verse 24 of Luke chapter 11, he says, And when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. So how does the unclean spirit get out of the man? By itself? Why? It's got a house. If you had a house and you were comfortable, wouldn't you stay? Somebody kicks him out. And when the unclean spirit goes out of man, because that's what they were talking about, wasn't it? The context? Jesus casts out demons by the power of Beelzebub. And when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest. And not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put into order. And then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. What in the world does that mean? How is that possible? What's going on? Look up here. You need to learn these words. I have preached on these words for the last 20 years. Transformed, not reformed. Transformed, not reformed. When God enters a person's life, he does not leave a vacuum of power. When you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, who controls you? Hmm? He better. What happens if you push him out? What happens if you don't want him there? Then where's the vacuum of power? That's, I'm just saying. How does this house stay empty? Because it was reformed. It was cleaned up and put in place and everything was all nice and neat and shiny, but there was no transformation. There was nobody seeking God. It was just cleaned up. How many times have you seen somebody who was not a very nice person? They go to church and they get all cleaned up, but they never produce one tiny bit of fruit for the kingdom. And I'm not talking about converts. I'm talking about acting like Jesus. They dress nice, they talk nice, they use all the church words until they go to work the next day. Or until they go to the bar every night. Or until they go and sleep with a, you know, someone that's not their wife. And how many of these people are in our church? Well, that's just the way he is. No, that's wrong. 
And what happens when the demon comes back? He goes, I didn't realize the house was this nice. I'm going to invite my friends over. And listen to the last phrase. The last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Hmm. Do you know there's another place in Scripture that sounds an awful lot like this? It's in 2 Peter. Chapter 2. Now, it's almost all the way to the end. Second Peter. We're going to start. I, I, I'm going to, just because I'm in an honorary mood tonight, I'm going to read just a, a verse out of chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. What? Second Peter, chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse two. I just, I'm having, I'm, I'm, I've gone off the rails. I'm on my soapbox now. Second Peter chapter one and verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, he has granted to us the precious and magnificent promises. Listen, so that <clears throat> by them, you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Okay? So file that away in the back of your mind. Because now we're going to chapter 2. In chapter 2, the entire chapter is about false prophets. It's about people who lead other people astray, people in church leading other people in church astray. I'm going to start in verse 17 because I don't have time to read the whole chapter. These false prophets, they're springs without water and their mist driven by the storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved for speaking out arrogant words of vanity. They entice by fleshly desire, by sensuality. That's just makes you feel good. That's not sex. That's making you feel good. Those who barely escape from the one, from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption for by what a man is overcome by this, he is enslaved for, Listen, if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. These words in verse 20 are the identical Greek words that you find in verses 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 1. In verses 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 1, we know he's talking about saved people because you've been partakers of the divine nature, right? Well, over here, they've escaped the defilements of the world. By the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now listen to verse 21. Verse 21 is scary. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. And it happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in a mire. Why would? Why in the world is it? What is, does Peter write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. It would have been better for them never to have been acquainted with God. It would have never been better for them to have been escaped the defilements of the world, is what Peter said, than to have known the way of righteousness and having known it to turn away from the Holy Commandment. Because according to the writer of Hebrews, once you've tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit, let me just read it to you. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. And I don't have time to go. We've been through this passage before, but I don't have time to go through it all tonight. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they themselves have fallen away, the Greek says walk away, if they have walked away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God, putting him to open shame. 
would have been better for those guys not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turn their backs on it. Why? Because once you turn your back on it, what does the Bible say? You can't come back. Again, lifestyle sin as opposed to seasonal sin. Now, what does this seem like? Intent. How does God judge you? Based on your actions or your intentions? Your intentions. Yeah, he judges you based on your heart. So here's the deal. I'm a 25-year-old young man, and I've got a wife and a couple of kids, and we're in church every Sunday, and I'm on fire for the Lord. I'm teaching Sunday school. I'm serving as, 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 as a, a deacon junior, learning how to be a deacon or a young elder, whatever your church is. doesn't matter. I'm, I'm in the church. My wife is serving in the church. My kids are in church all the time. They're active involved. And I'm off at work one day, and my wife and the kids were going to the grocery store, and some drunk T-bowed them and killed them all. And I get mad at God. How dare you kill my family? I thought you loved me. How dare you? Many of us in here know those people, don't we? What is the intent of that heart? It's broken into a million pieces, and it doesn't know who to be mad at. So it gets mad at the safest being it could get mad at, God. Did you know that when we yell at people, we always yell at the person that's the safest? The person we know isn't going to leave us? That's the way it is. So this person is broken and almost beyond repair. But God is patient. What happened to the wife and the kids? They went to be with Jesus, right? But in his loneliness, this guy can't see it. And he just gets mad at God and he wanders away from the church for a while, maybe 20 or 30 years. And one day God sits down next to him and he said, hey, how you doing? And the guy goes, you know, I'm still mad at you. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry that happened. Sin affects us all. Other people's sin affects us. And I'm sorry about that. You could have done something about it. Yeah, I could have. I could have not let Lazarus die too. But people have to learn things. And unfortunately, most people are experiential learners. I don't want to learn that lesson. I know you didn't. What's going on here? Is that man saying, get away from me, God, I don't want anything to do with you? No, he's saying, I was mad at you for a long time, but I still talk to you. Even if I'm yelling at you, I'm still talking to you. I'm not denying your existence. Now, that's opposed to somebody who stands up and openly says, I was a Christian. I saw what God had to offer, and I don't want it. It's all a bunch of lies and fairy tales. Now, there are people who will say, well, you know, doesn't John say in 1 John chapter three, that they went out from us, but they were never really a part of us. True. That's true in some cases, but isn't true in all cases. There are way too many historically documented people who were pastors and seminary professors who have walked away and said, God isn't real. And it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turn their back on it. This is deep stuff. This is not fun stuff. But I would not be doing my job as a herald of scripture if I did not continue to put these warnings in front of you and say, this is what the Bible says could happen. Because there are people out there, good, honest preachers out there say, this is not possible. What he's saying is heretical. It's not true. It can't be that way. And I'm fine with that. I don't have to prove my point and I don't have to be right. All I have to say is this is what the Bible says. But you're not preaching it in the entire context of Scripture. No, because I only have an hour. If God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the writer of Hebrews said, how come God was able to give King Saul the spirit of a prophet so that he prophesied? And then when King Saul became disobedient, God removed that spirit and gave him an evil spirit. Well, that was Old Testament, Pat. 
God doesn't do that. But I thought he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah, but he was a different God in the Old Testament. No, he wasn't. Same God. Same God. I'm just telling you. I, I, I don't have a theology to protect here other than the fact that I know that God is sovereign. And I am not. And the, the Bible describes me as his bond servant and his child, not his equal and not his partner. And I have to look at his words and say, is that what you meant? Not just what you said, but is that what you meant? So if there is someone who pretends to be cleaned, reformed, because they accepted the, ten the tenets of Christianity, but they never accepted the power of God in their life, what is that demon going to do? He's going to go get his buddies and come back. And God says it would have been better for him to just have the one than have eight. Be careful. Be careful. And the last thing, good, we'll get finished tonight. I want to talk about people who are truly blessed. So the crowd's getting there and they're kind of quiet. You ever watch those golf games? And I hate this guy. I don't know who he is. And I use that word very carefully when I use it. But I used to watch golf a lot. I haven't watched it in years because we don't have real TV anymore. We just have internet TV. And guys would hit the ball. And right when they hit the ball, they'd be 3,000 yards from the hole, Right. And there was that some dumb guy in the crowd, excuse me, guys, get in the hole! I'm like, it's golf, you idiot, shut up. <laughs> He's not going to get in the hole for 3,000 yards. Well, so that's what you see. you got this crowd going on here. Jesus teaching this heavy stuff. Everybody's kind of quiet, right? And this lady yells out from the back while Jesus was saying these things. One of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you were nursed. And everybody went, well, okay, that's awkward. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and, what does it say? No. Your word, yours might say practice it. Keep it is a much better word. Protect it and do it. This word has a double meaning. How many of us protect the word of God in our heart? How many of us hide it in there we garrison it in our heart so that when the, de the devil comes against us, when the lies of doubt come against us, when our own desires rise up in us, we have garrisoned this word in our heart that says, just the other day I started. I, my brain never stops. I don't know if you've ever met anybody like that. My brain, it, even when I'm asleep, it's solving problems. It never stops. And it's never quiet, ever. Just never, there's never, I look at my wife when we started dating and I said, what are you thinking about? She went, nothing. And I thought she was lying because I didn't know that was possible. I found out since then, there are people who can actually do that. They could sit there and go, Blank. and they're like, what are you thinking about? And they go, nothing. And I'm like, that's not possible. You can't do that. So, you know, the, the idea here is in my mind, there's so many things go through all the time. And I get these antelope thoughts. That's what I call them. My brain is thinking about this and all of a sudden this other thought goes, and I went, oh, what was that? You know, and then I go back to think it's, huh? No, it was an antelope. That's what an antelope looks like. <laughs> so it runs by. And, and sometimes these antelope thoughts are not very good thoughts. They just go, <laughs> you know. And, 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 and I chased one one day. I wasn't paying it. It was just this week. And I wasn't, I was thinking about working on my shop, you know, just stuff in there. Got to do this and do that. And, this. <laughs> and it wasn't a very nice thought. It was a thought that could have led me someplace that I didn't want to go. And I looked at it and I went, oh, I'm tired of thinking about this stuff. I don't even think about that. <laughs> right? And then the scripture comes into my mind and it says, the mindset on the flesh is death. But the mindset on the, li the, li the, 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 mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the flesh, this is Romans chapter 8, the mindset on the flesh cannot please God. And I went, Bye. And I went back to thinking about my shop because the, the word had garrisoned me. It was protecting me and I was protecting the word because it was in my heart. And as soon as I just my 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 natural inclination, my humanness said, let's chase that. 
the spirit said, here, what are you going to do with that? And I'm like, party pooper. <laughs> you know? So the person who's truly blessed is not the one who knows God's word. It's the one who protects it and obeys it. How many of us know people who know God's word and are mean as snot? They beat you up with it. It's their club to tell you that you're worthless. And every time they tell you that, they're denying the very word that they're beating you with because God said your worth is not found in who you are, but it was found on the cross of my son. I place that high of a value that I would pay your ransom with his blood. So your worthiness is not found in who you are. It's found in me. And that's garrisoning, garrisoning God's word in your heart. All right. I know this wasn't a fun lesson, but it's an important lesson because we need to remember who God is and who we are not. I am not God, and I don't ever want to be. It seemed like a very hard job. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, and we thank you for who you are and what you've done. And I, I, so many things in the New Testament and the Old Testament that just scare us to death. But you don't. Even though we have great respect for you and honor you and glorify you and realize that you have the capacity to do horrific things, we read in the, the Revelation what you are going to do to this world. All based on your character and your justice. And we think somehow that you will treat us differently. Help us to walk humbly before you, not in pride and arrogance, not in self-centeredness, but understanding that you are not a tame lion. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you need to be treated as such. Thank you for loving us every day and walking with us every day. But please, God, please help us remember that the world and your universe does not revolve around us, that we worship you and the universe is yours alone. And every breath that I take, is by your grace and my ability to stand in your presence is only by the grace gift that you offered. Help me to remember who you are. We love you, Father, and we pray this in your name. Amen.